You're listening to Barbell Logic, the podcast where we talk about what it means to experience strength and how you can use simple, hard, and effective strategies in training and nutrition to improve your life. It starts with meeting you where you are right now and finding lasting solutions. Welcome to the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Barbell Logic, Beast Over Burden. I'm your host, Nikki Sims. I'm the Chief Experience Officer at Barbell Logic. Andrew Jackson is with me. He is our Chief Operations Officer, as well as our Product Manager for Turnkey Coach. Howdy. Hey, Andrew. How's it going? Doing well yourself? Really good. Really good. Nice. I am on my second cup of coffee, which I usually only have one. Mm. I am feeling it. Caffeine. <laughs> Does the body good. <laughs> Hopefully it stays until I go do my leg workout in like two hours. <laughs> nice. Where I will go to the gym and I will see a bunch of broccoli heads in Crocs taking up the machines and I will have to wait for them. Mm. Alas. Yeah, because they're still on summer break. Just because that's where they work out. Mm. <laughs> they're always there. <laughs> yeah, it amazes me. I just had a client uh, show up in Crocs for his squat two days ago. And that <sighs> was a near-death experience. I've never worn Crocs. And even when I look at people wearing them, I'm just like, how are you not falling around all the time? And then we see all these people lifting in them. And it's just me being, I guess, a boomer yelling at clouds, as you would say, where I'm just like, what is this? But it seems like it's sketchy. Yeah, did not go well for this guy. He is still figuring out the walkout. I mean, as you might expect only been lifting for a few weeks so still figuring some things out i suggested he get some weightlifting shoes he apparently took that to mean how about i try crocs <laughs> <laughs> i sent him a link to some shoes he could try well they're both hideous crocs and all weightlifting shoes are hideous he's a software engineer he can afford a pair of hundred dollar shoes but figured and i gave him the explanation the rationale Behind lifting shoes, stable platform, non-compressible sole, all this good stuff. Intelligent guy thought Crocs might be better than the tennis shoes he was wearing. <laughs> and in <laughs> fact, he almost fell down. Oh, surprise. I yeah. bet that felt like a surprise for him. I've been coaching my sister and she just got some lifting shoes. She was lifting in like Chuck Taylor's. And then she got some lifting shoes. Her squat seriously improved that day. Yeah. She got like two and a half inches more depth and she's really leggy. So it made a huge difference for her. And it just like everything looked so much more stable, like yeah. instant game changer. And I think you just don't believe that a shoe can make that much difference until you actually do it. But it, it's such a game changer. I actually squat in my tennis shoes last week while on the road. And it wasn't horrible, but definitely was not fun. <laughs> yeah, it's different. I can't squat and not lift shoes anymore. It's really hard. I'll do it in a pinch, but yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so the Olympics just wrapped up. Those are really fun. Yeah, it was a pretty good Olympics. Had a lot of controversy this year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Opening ceremony got a bunch of fun discussion. A couple of athletes getting into all kinds of trouble. I don't know if trouble is the right word. Oh, they were having too much fun. They were having too much fun in the Olympic Village. Is that what it was? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were funny examples of people. Like there was one guy that ended up uh, sleeping in the park <laughs> instead of the room because like the anti-sex beds were too uncomfortable and there was no air conditioning. So he just went out and slept in the park. <laughs> oh, you're into football lately. Have you seen the beef between the 100-meter sprinter and uh, Tyreek Hill? No. Oh my so gosh. Lyle. Noah Lyle? Yeah. So he said that National Football League players that claim to be world champions are, you know, not actual world champions. Oh, I like this. I like this beef. <laughs> <laughs> because there's only professional football in the U.S., really. Yeah. I would love to see them race. That sounds very awesome. Yeah, so Tyreek Hill said two things. Lyle should stay in his lane. And then when he gets back to the U.S., that he would beat him in a 100-meter dash. Hell so. yes. Let's see it. <laughs> like, those egos are so big. I don't even know if they could do it in the same, like, auditorium or stadium. 
those two guys. Yeah, probably. That could be a fun event to watch, though. Absolutely. Yep. I would love to watch that. I mean, they could probably make a ton of money off of that, too. I'm oh, yeah. I would be surprised if they didn't There'd be a whole it. YouTube channel for it. <laughs> We'd have to get a new subscription that we would sign up for a monthly, you know, six ninety nine, and we would watch commercials. Yeah. And we'd get sponsorships. Oh, yeah. Huge opportunity. I don't know. I love the Olympics to really see and experience like the far side of the bell curve, human physical expression and work ethic. I saw that a lot. We watched a lot of track and field and I loved seeing, I know I already told you about this, what it looked like at the end of a race and after the finish line. Right. Because during whatever event they're doing, they're so collected They've worked so hard for this and they like keep their cool and they work really hard, but their faces tend to be really calm. Like it's so hard to understand the difference between what they're doing and what like a normal human being is doing. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. The speed of these runners is amazing and they make it look so smooth and they're running in a pack. So it's not like there's a normal human accountant also running to see what the difference is. But then when they cross the finish line and they just hit the ground, then you start to remember how your legs have felt or how my legs have felt when I've worked really hard. And it feels like your muscles are just going to explode off of your body and you can't get your air and you see how hard they were working. I love that moment. I thought that was a treat to see how hard they work. That was fun. Yeah, I've had the pleasure, honor, whatever you want to say, of training with two Olympians. Yeah. Or actually three Olympians. Two that were on the my crew team. Joey Hansen, who went on to win the gold medal in the men's eight 2004. And Josh Inman, who was also on the crew team, uh, won the bronze in 2008. Wow. And then at my old weightlifting gym, I trained with Melanie Roach, who was at the Beijing Olympics. She was going to be in the 2000 Olympics and then had an injury that took her out of the competition, but she came back and trained in 2008 and tried to make a run for 2012, but didn't quite qualify. But in all three cases, it was really interesting how, to your point, they genetically had a starting point that was above and beyond everyone else. Like day one, yeah. they you know, just were at a different end of the bell curve, yeah. like you said. But then also with all three of them, they had a work ethic that was beyond anyone else as well. Always the one showing up before practice, staying after, consistently pushing themselves every single day. And I think that's what really, you know, into the game, you've got to have that genetic ability. But to compete at that level, you've also got to have just kind of an incredible mindset and work ethic as well. Especially with sports like, well, most of the Olympic sports, there's just such a grueling mental battle yeah. along with the physical battle that you've got to be pretty resilient. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun to watch. Uh, obviously weightlifting, but I saw a stat that I thought was actually maybe the most impressive of what I've seen of the Olympics that I saw was actually a distance runner. Uh, Sifan Hassan from the Netherlands 37 hours after winning bronze in the 10,000 meter run, which is kind of a middle distance. She also got bronze in the 5,000 meter and then got the gold medal and set an Olympic world record marathon time of two hours, 22 minutes and 55 seconds. Oh my God. <laughs> that is such a broad range of capacity. That's amazing. The speed range, well, I mean, for two different aspects of it, the speed difference between the 5K, 10K, and the marathon is just insanely different. Yeah. The fact that she did it back to back to back, basically, with very little time to recover is also amazing. And then to be at that level with all three, to me, I don't know, it is just crazy. Yeah. But then we also got to watch the third gold medal from La Shaw. Oh, yeah. In weightlifting. In men's heavyweight. The gold medal, first women's gold medal since 2000, I think. Might have been medal for women's weightlifting. Yeah, and she was in the 71 kilogram and her name... Olivia Reeves. Olivia, the gold yeah. gold medal. Yep, US. That was really fun to watch. She had such a big clean and jerk. Yeah. 
that kind of just like LaShaw did. You just walk out there and I've felt this way in a meet before because my squat is rubbish. My bench press is okay, but my deadlift is where I would bring the heat. (laughs) I would just like be sitting there so excited to deadlift because I knew I was just going to add hundreds of pounds to my total. And to know that feeling that I imagine she had just like kind of sitting there waiting to just go like do her opener, which was, you know, I think tens of kilos over a lot of others for their clean and jerk. That must have just felt so exciting. (laughs) Yeah. She won, I think, with her opener. I think so. Yeah. There might have been one person that was kind of in contention that missed their third attempt. She got a second attempt at 147 and a half or something like that. And then just barely missed 150 kilos, 330 pounds. So cool. It's pretty wild. Over double body weight. Yeah. From the jerk. That was pretty awesome. It's like I deadlifted that for a hard set of three <laughs> this weekend. Yeah. So cool. Well, same with LaShaw. He snatched 215 and clean and jerked. 255 or something like that. Yeah. So it's like take my lifetime deadlift and he threw that overhead and (laughs) like a heavy, a heavy set of five for me and he's snatching that. But tell me what you thought about the commentators. So bad. I don't know what the deal. Oh my God, they were terrible. Those of these guys, they had no idea what they were watching. No. They barely knew who was lifting and the only comment that they had about Anything happening technically was that they pulled the bar off the floor too fast. Too fast (laughs) off the floor on that one. A bridge too far, he kept saying. (laughs) (laughs) And we watched track, we watched gymnastics, we watched basketball. Right. And those commentators, they knew what they were talking about. They had actually competed in the sport. Right. But this guy, I think they just found in a pub. Well, they usually, just like any sport, you have the straight man who's just like the play caller or woman, and then the color commentator who's just adding in like, here's what it's like to be there. You know, there's so much you can talk about Yeah, in a weightlifting competition that most people don't know is happening, but you could be talking about even in the back room. Like you could fill up explanation of what's happening in the downtime. And there were some dramatics between like, the judges reviewing some of the lifts. There were, you know, strategy in the attempts that you call because you have the ability to change your attempt three different times. And with each one, you get different amounts of rest time based on how that changes the sequence and the gamesmanship that people will play with their opener, who's listing, you know, a conservative start versus who's trying to like pretend like they're going to come in at a certain point, who's getting like a really low opener and then they're going to jump 10 kilos right. to try to throw the competition off. Like there's all that kind of stuff happening at that level and there was zero comment about it. No. It was just... He had like three things to repeat and they were all useless. Yeah. And the I think we've talked about it before, like the angles were all not very useful either. Like zooming in on the plates. <laughs> oh, yeah. The camera work is terrible. Yeah. The overhead shot, like you get almost <laughs> no information from. Or if you could get information, they certainly didn't comment on it other than no. the fact that it was an overhead shot. I mean, you could look at the bar path, maybe you could look at a few things, but nothing. Just here's an overhead shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a wasted opportunity because it was really cool. And I don't think they had any point of reference at how heavy these weights were. The only time you got to really appreciate how heavy these weights were was when they dropped it and they didn't bounce. The thud. They just, a uh, massive thud. <laughs> like, right. Yeah, no yeah. comment on the relative weight to their body weight. Right. Yeah, it was unfortunate. Yeah. And I don't know why either, because weightlifting has gotten popular enough in the US at least that and I know there's some popular live streamers. It's probably what we should have done is found a live stream to go along with it or, you know, some sort of podcast recording or something. Cause probably could have, honestly, a CrossFit coach would have been better. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, on that point, is, I think CrossFit, I was reflecting on this because there was also a, a medal in the men's category, a bronze medal, Hampton Morris lifted really well. And actually, arguably, both. Olivia Reeves and Hampton Morris are some of the best, if not the best, American weightlifters we've had in at least, you know, several years, if not decades. And I think you can attribute a lot of this to the rise of CrossFit 20-ish years ago. For sure. That's how you got 
that's how I got into to barbells more seriously. I mean, I started barbell training in high school and college, but got back into it as an adult doing a CrossFit for a year first and and then got into more of a traditional strength training program. And then that's how I got into weightlifting. So yeah, my experience directly relates to the rise of CrossFit as well. Same. Yeah, same. I was introduced to powerlifting by... It was the bad introduction. It was like one of those kind of old crusty powerlifting coaches who was just like, I could barely squat 65 pounds. They're like, let's put any wraps on. <laughs> I was like, that, was, that was not the best introduction. So I immediately pivoted away from that. But eventually through CrossFit got into weightlifting and then powerlifting or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, big drama in the CrossFit world this weekend too. Yeah, CrossFit games were last week as well. If you haven't heard, there was a CrossFit event. I don't actually know what the event were. And this was for the games, correct? Mm -hmm. But there was an open water swim and one of the athletes was a hundred meters from the finish. Yeah, not not you so could actually in the, the video line. you could see him drowning, Lazar Dukic from the finish line. Really disturbing. But yeah, he drowned in open water and it was it was really awful to be able to see it and to see all the people around him and to see the judges and to just witness the actual death of this guy. It was really awful. And so yeah, big loss. Lots of upset because it seems like it really could have been prevented. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to armchair quarterback, but there are so many people around that it's hard to... Well, there's one of the biggest problems is, and CrossFit has done this in the past, they put the swim last or at least after already running. So the competitors, the athletes are already fatigued going into an event where if you gas out, unlike the bike or the run, you just stop. <laughs> The swim, if you stop, you die. Yeah. Unless somebody yanks you out of the water. And Matt Frazier actually apparently almost drowned in 2017 in a similar event. They didn't have enough supervision, even though they had people out on paddle boards nearby. Obviously didn't see it. And drowning is interesting because, I mean, I'm sure if you're a professional lifeguard, you're more sensitive to it, but it's not super obvious to an untrained eye. Kind of looks, and even in the video, you're not quite sure if he's swimming or if he's drowning. And there's a couple points towards the end where it looks like he's actually bobbing up, heading down, but it's not like he can yell. Right. You just, for a brief few seconds, see some splashing and, and a head bobbing that if you're not really focused on it, it's very easy to miss somewhat understandable how quickly and easily it can happen. But for a competition where this is a known risk, it's totally avoidable as well. This is the double-edged sword of CrossFit, you know, that's been around for years that it's got so much energy, enthusiasm and potential, but there's this dark side to the culture also of, I mean, every all the way back to Pukey the Clown and it's sort of like part of the culture to be on edge like that. Yeah. But obviously pushed too far. Yeah, that was a tough thing to... Big loss. Yeah, definitely tragic. So yeah, inherent risks in those sports, especially in a competition where you're definitely pushing yourself to the limit. And then, you know, just to bring this back to something that's relevant to everybody is actual safety consideration in our own gyms. We have lots of videos out there about it, actually, about setting safeties for squats, safeties for bench press, not putting a bunch of your gym equipment on the floor so you don't trip over it, you know, being really careful about that and being mindful of it. And that's just something that we can control in our own home spaces. So safeties, use your safeties, especially on incline bench press. Andrew. I do. <laughs> but yeah, it was a good couple weeks of Olympics and that was really fun to watch. Really great to see human potential. I love it and I found it inspirational. Agreed. But if you're looking to explore what it's like to be strong, and while there are so many different ranges of strength, actual capacity, I think it's really, really cool to learn what your own capacity is and what you're capable of. So if you're curious about learning more about that, set up a call with us, barbelllogic.com slash experience. We'd love to talk you through lifting, what that would look like to work with a coach. And it goes back to our tagline, experience strength. 
So many people are out there actually experiencing weakness without actually knowing or without knowing what that is. And when you start to experience what it's like to be strong, it's different and it's fun. So I will leave you with that. If you got some value out of this and we hope you did, please leave us a review, give us a share and we'll be here next week on Beast Over Burden. Thanks, Andrew. Bye-bye.